Hello, my friends. Welcome to Lindy's Magpie Reads. This is a place where I talk about books and I have finished 11 books since my last video. So I'm gonna to try to go through them quickly. But even so, you're probably gonna to wanna to grab a beverage <laughs> before you start watching the rest of this. Uh, and I'm gonna fill you in a little bit on what's going on with me lately. Lori and I are celebrating our 28th anniversary. So we're gonna be going out to a late lunch. I'm gonna get this finished before that. Well, finish the filming. Everything all together, uh, when I do a video like this, usually takes me about six hours. So I may or may not get this posted on Saturday, October 19th, the day that I am filming. It's an important date because this is election day here in British Columbia. So of course we're gonna go vote. And I've got a couple of trips coming up uh, all next week. From Monday to Monday, I'm going to be at the Vancouver Writers Festival, staying with my dear friend, Kathy, who's always so generous about accommodating me in her little apartment. And then I'm gonna be home for a day and a half and I'll be heading off to Portland, Oregon to see Christine Sinclair play her final soccer game. I'm not a sporty spice, but uh, yes, my friend Deanna um, had a spare ticket, asked if I was interested. So yeah, I guess it'll be a historic occasion the only really sporty thing I do is rowing and I'm happy to report that after two months of recovering from COVID, I was finally able to get back on the water. Now at this time of year, uh, most of the rowing, the morning rows are in the dark and that really doesn't appeal to me. But on Sundays at noon, there's a community row. So I went last week in a single and the week before that in a double. I'm not gonna be able to go tomorrow because Laurie and I are going to the opera. We're going to hear Mozart's La Camenza di Tito, which is the first time I will have heard and seen that opera. All I know is that it's set in Rome in I think the first century common era. Whew, lots, lots happening around here. On Wednesday this past week, I went to the City of Victoria Book Prize Gala event and didn't get photos, but I had a great time. I was sitting right next to the author, Wade Compton. We had a, a nice time chatting with each other. There are two categories, oh, wow. an adult category and a children's category. And the winner in the adult category is this collection of short fiction anecdotes by Catherine Mockler. And in the children's category, it's a book called Breaking News by Raina Delisle. And as soon as I got home, I was able to check out a digital edition of Breaking News. So that's the book I'm gonna tell you about now. The subtitle is Why Media Matters. And this book is aimed at ages nine to 14. And it pretty much covers the history of journalism or sharing news. Oh, so much great stuff in there. There's lots of original illustrations by Julie McLaughlin, as well as photographs. Uh, Julie McLaughlin, by the way, was the winner of the City of Victoria Book Prize last year for her illustrations in a book called Little Pine Cone, which is now on my TBR. So breaking news covers things like how to trust news sources, what to look for, how to detect fake news. Uh, it talks about the risks for journalists, 
talking about how they can experience violence and intimidation on the job uh, because of powerful people like politicians, leaders of criminal organizations, and even police officers sometimes who don't want certain stories to get out to the public or are mad that they did. And so they threaten, hurt, imprison, or even kill journalists to keep them quiet or punish them. And there's also a lot of harassment, especially towards female journalists. Now this actually comes up in another book that I'm going to be telling you about shortly, Carol Off's book, At a Loss for Words. In the section on sensationalism, here's a quote, if it bleeds, it leads. This grim expression in journalism means that bad news involving conflict, violence, and injury gets featured prominently because people are more interested in it than in good news. However, several studies have found that consuming too much bad news can harm your mental health. Research also shows that people are less likely to trust news outlets if their coverage is always negative, especially if it doesn't reflect people's daily lives. In a section on whistleblowers, there's a tax haven story where 350 journalists from 80 countries broke an important story. And this issue of taxes also comes up in Carol Off's book. So it's a really good example of how there's synchronicity in our reading. And in today's episode, I actually have three books that are tied to journalism. The next one is a picture book, Spider in the Well. It's by Jess Hannigan, who's an artist in Ontario. It's her debut picture book. I, this would work really well for if you're looking for a spooky October read because a lot of the colors are Halloween-like with the fluorescent orange and the black. So the main characters in Spider in the Well are a newsboy and the spider. And it's kind of a dark fable, very funny. It's got this bold graphic art. It's very striking. And while the primary audience for this book is ages three to eight, with young children, there's always going to be an adult reading the picture book. And there is a lot for adults to enjoy in this book as well. Um, kind of in the same way that John Classen's books have that, uh, you know, layering of appeal. Because the issues in here are uh, important ones. So media accuracy, socioeconomic inequality, there's greed and hypocrisy. Ah, it's great. Loved it. And the third book that is news related is by Canadian journalist Carol Off. At a loss for words. Conversation in an age of rage. I listened to the audiobook read by the author. Carol Off is going to be at the Vancouver Writers' Fest, and I'm excited to hear her there. Oh, this, this book, so good. Uh, even if you're not interested in politics, I still recommend it, because what she's doing in here is focusing on words and how when certain words are hijacked or weaponized or, um, or, or, you know, their meaning gets changed, how can we have a civil conversation? So she focuses on six key words, freedom, democracy, truth, woke, choice, and taxes. And the when she was talking about 
how we get information, you know, news sources. This is one passage, probably the most effective gambit on the part of Stephen Harper's conservative government was Harper's initiative to shut science down at its source. The Canadian government issued a gag order that prohibited Canada's government-funded scientists and researchers from speaking to the media or publishing their results. He also slashed their funding. So she gives the example about how it took 11 government officials and an exchange of 50 emails in order to decide how they should respond to one question from a reporter concerning snowfall. There's a documentary called Silence of the Labs that came out about 10 years ago uh, talking about all this and I am going to link it below because you can watch it on YouTube. It came out from uh, CBC's Fit the State. Towards the end of the book, Carol Off quotes Astra Taylor, and I have Astra Taylor's uh, book, The Age of Insecurity, out from the library right now because it is a finalist for the Governor General's Award. I don't know if I'm going to be able to get to it uh, before it's due back at the library, but another book that I'm very much looking forward to reading. Uh, next, I've got uh, fiction, <laughs> something fun. Uh, it's called The Night Guest, and it's by Hildur Knutsdotter, who is Icelandic. It was translated by Mary Robinette Kowal, and the audiobook is read by Mary Kowal. This, it's a very short um, kind of horror novel, ghostly, spooky, uh, set in contemporary Reykjavik. So once again, for those of you who like spooky stuff in October, this is perfect. The protagonist is a young woman named Ethan who is waking up exhausted every morning and her doctor can't figure out why she's so tired all the time. Well, it turns out something is going on at night. This is quite eerie and unsettling and it's very short. It's only about three hours long and I felt like it was a good palate cleanser in between other stuff. I did a, read a lot of nonfiction in the past uh, week. But next is another short book, Griffin Town by Marie-Hélène Poitras, who's a Quebecoise uh, author. This was translated into English by Sheila Fishman. And I heard about it because of the best Canadian books of the 21st century project that I did with Jolene of Bookworm Adventure Girl. I will link information about that project down below. I also talked about this on uh, a different video, the best French Canadian books of the 21st century. And I finally had a chance to read it. Very glad that I did. It's short, only 161 pages and it's about some dark subjects uh, gentrification and the criminal underworld so it's contemporary montreal but old montreal where they have carriage rides for tourists in the summer and the main protagonist is marie who loves horses and she wants to be one of these carriage drivers. So we meet the horses and the other drivers and her idealism kind of runs up against some dark stuff. Yeah. It's described as an urban western with a clash between good and evil and yeah, that pretty much sums it up. 
Next, I have a children's book, uh, Sisters of the Never Sea. It's by Cynthia Leitich Smith, who is Muskogee Creek. And this is a Peter Pan retelling whose primary audience is probably kids between ages 8 and 12. It's about a blended family. Uh, Wendy's comes from a white family and her father marries Lily's mother and Lily is Muskogee Creek. Then they have uh, a new sibling, their little brother, Michael. And uh, there is so much to delight in in this retelling, but I was especially happy at the way that racism is dealt with like very straightforwardly in it when they get to Neverland and Peter is talking about Injuns, for example, neither Wendy nor Lily are going to put up with that. No, this is not a word that you use. <laughs> it's, uh, and I also really liked the way that there's a breaking of the fourth wall with the omniscient narrator addressing the reader directly. And there's a lot of humor too. I'm just going to read one little passage. It's my favorite. So Wendy and Lily get to Neverland separately. And so Lily is trying to find Wendy and her brother, Michael. She meets some of the indigenous kids on the island and says, I'm Muskogee Creek from the Tulsa Burbs. I came for my brother and stepsister. Have you seen them? He's four. She's annoying. The family dynamics in here are also really great. Uh, Tinkerbell, who's Belle in the story, is also, you know, she's got a great backstory and uh, character development in here. Ah, so much fun. I really enjoyed this. And next I have a memoir in verse, How the Boogeyman Became a Poet. It's by Tony Keith, who is black American gay poet and hip hop artist and educator. And this is his coming of age and coming out story, all told in verse. There are a lot of uh, photographs in here and the poems that he wrote when he was a teenager in high school. We also see his handwriting uh, there, uh, you know, it really gives you a feel for it. He graduated from high school in 1999. So yeah, that's 25 years ago. And he's describing uh, AOL, Messenger, dial-up computers, um, you know, how he found other members of the gay community, uh, his fear, the fact that privacy is survival, um, you know, that he didn't feel safe coming out, uh, and uh, you know, all all of that is in here, and the language of that time and place is also a part of this. Uh, he comes from the area around Washington D.C., and the expression "for real, for real" comes up often. Uh, Getting busy is the way that they talk about hooking up in here. And uh, there's a movie that he mentions several times as being really important that I wasn't familiar with at all. You might be. It's called Love Jones, and it came out in 1997. A quote from Jason Reynolds on the front calls it a life-affirming masterpiece. So... <laughs> There you go. Uh, I found it quite moving. It's, it's suitable for ages 14 to adult. More children's nonfiction. This is called How Was That Built? Stories Behind Awesome Structures. And it's by Roma Agrawal, who's a British South Asian structural engineer. Now, one of the 
important buildings that she worked on for six years was the Shard in London, and that's a building that's featured in here. It's Western Europe's tallest structure. So there's skyscrapers, tunnels, bridges, you know, all kinds of engineering uh, examples using materials like uh, brick and concrete and glass and steel. I've always been curious about how uh, bridges and underwater construction is done because how do you deal with all that water? So I learned about caissons and cofferdams in this book. And talking about caissons, when the Brooklyn Bridge was built, it was a husband and wife engineering team. So like this is the 1800s and a woman was an important engineer because her husband got sick. Uh, and so she ended up taking over the construction of this uh, huge project. And the first tunnel that was built under the Thames River in London was in the 1800s. And the felt the engineer who figured out how to do that was inspired by shipworms on how to dig. So that's another thing that I found really cool about this book is how engineers have been inspired by the natural world, a skeleton of a sea urchin or uh, the way that uh, bird's bones are made you know, that sort of thing. So cool. There's an underwater restaurant in here in the Maldives. Oh, and talking about foundations, the Metropolitan Cathedral in Mexico City is built on top of an Aztec pyramid, which was in a lake. And all of Mexico, the central part of Mexico City was formerly a lake that they filled in. And so over the last 150 years, the central part of Mexico City has sunk three stories deep. The way that they leveled out the cathedral because it was all tilting was also explained in here so much fascinating stuff. This book is especially aimed at readers between ages 8 and 13, but Agrawal has also written a similar book for adults, and it's just called Built. So you might want to look for that. So I've got uh, two nonfiction audiobooks coming up next, starting with Turning to Stone, Discovering the Subtle Wisdom of Rocks. It's by Marsha Bjornerud. And the audiobook is read by Rebecca Stern. So this is both memoir and popular science. Bjornerud is a geologist and she is passionate about her subject. I couldn't help but get excited too. So for example, she talks about sandstone and how important it is for purifying our water in the aquifers uh, underground. She talks about basalt and how important it is for regulating temperature on the planet Earth. Uh, granite. Uh, I learned that only strong rocks like granite can generate earthquakes because it needs to be rocks that are strong enough to withstand a lot of pressure and then release it seismically. So if a rock is too weak, it just oozes or flows and just doesn't build up that kind of pressure. There's a question that geologists can't answer, and that is why we have so much granite on this planet. <sighs> There's puzzles like that. I didn't even know it was a puzzle. So all of this is interspersed with memoir stuff, like telling us how her favorite pastime when she was a child was 
to play with this big jar of buttons and she would dump them out and sort them by size, sort them by color, sort them by type. And, you know, there was never one way that every button could be satisfactorily sorted into a system. Uh, yeah, so she's a person who thinks about classification and thinking about the earth as a whole, uh, I think has really given her the feeling. She says that she's a citizen of the earth rather than a US citizen. Uh, she has two sons who uh, often traveled with her to research sites. And that leads me to the next book, the Curve of Time by a Canadian travel writer, M. Wiley Blanchett. The audiobook is read by Heather Henderson. Now, this was first published in 1961, and the author was born in 1891 and died in 1961, shortly after this book came out. It's definitely stands the test of time. So Blanchett uh, is from Montreal and she and her husband moved to Vancouver Island in 1922 with their four kids. So at that time they were, I think, nine, eight, five, and three. And then they had a fifth child after moving here. And her husband died in 1926. So what she did for the summers, she would spend four months at a time with five kids on this boat that they owned, a 25-foot cruiser with about 150 square feet of space. She describes you know, where they all slept on this boat. And they would just spend the summers going up and down the coastline of British Columbia. And this is a collection of uh, her writings compiled over the course of a number of years. So sometimes uh, there's only three of the children there. Uh, the older two girls are off at school. Uh, sometimes the dog is with them, sometimes not. They meet loggers and fishers and other people who like to live out in the wilds. They encounter things like bears and cougars and stormy weather and fog and uh, engine trouble. And uh, it's just uh, inspiring and a lovely travel writing. Some of the information in here that she shares about the uh, coastal indigenous people and about killer whales are uh, not accurate now, but there's nothing that's offensive, really. I just I really enjoyed listening to this. And I've got one book left to tell you about. So my favorite of the bunch, hard to pick a favorite. I, these, these were all books that I recommend. This one is Babe in the Woods, The Art of Getting Lost. And it's by the uh, American artist, Julie Heffernan. This is full of her gorgeous, gorgeous artwork. It is uh, auto fiction. She says it took her 20 years before she confessed to her husband what happened during the two days that this story covers. So what happened was she told her husband she was going to go stay at his mother's cabin uh, for a couple of days with their infant son because she just needed to get out of the heat of New York City. And she went for a walk with the child in the Appalachian Mountains, intending it to be a day hike, and she got lost and ended up spending the night and coming down on the other side of the mountain 
from where she went up. Uh, and then when she got home, she didn't tell her husband what happened. So this whole book is full of her walking and thinking. There is a lot going on in her head. Uh, grief over her mother having recently died. She's thinking back to her childhood with her siblings. She was the youngest and she was a bedwetter, always humiliating. Uh, she thinks about her gallery representative, uh, Enzo, who has not treated her well. She's very angry with him. She talks about Rebecca Solnit's idea that walking helps to align our body, mind, and soul. And that's exactly what she needs. Uh, I, I'm just going to flip through and show you a little bit. Oh, yes, I love this so much. And that's all I've got for you today. So thank you so much for watching. I always appreciate hearing from you. So please say hello in the comments down below. Let me know if you want to pick up any of these books. Let me know what you're reading. I hope to get... Uh, one or some videos out talking about the Vancouver Writers Fest. We shall see. Who knows? It might be a while before my next video. In the meantime, happy reading everyone. Bye for now.